What's going on guys? A lot of crazy things happened in the NBA today, but we'll start with the most important, and that's that the NBA finally put out their list of the top 15 greatest coaches of all time. Now, we're gonna go one by one, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. There were some huge trades today that I was not prepared for to wake up to, and it felt like after the first big trade this morning, it just got crazier. Uh, so we'll start with the, the first big Woj bomb. We got the trade deadline coming on Thursday. And this is, you know, this is it. This is Super Bowl time for Woj and Shams and all those guys to just <clears throat> to go nuts with scoops. And this first one is is crazy for a lot of reasons. So we have the Portland Trailblazers finally agreeing to trade CJ McCollum. And they send CJ McCollum, Larry Nance Jr., and Tony Snell to the New Orleans Pelicans for Josh Hart, Thomas Sadaransky, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Didi Luzada, and a 2022 protected first round pick and two second round picks in the future. And, and that's it. it. It feels like a really unceremonious, unsentimental ending to a decade of CJ and Dame as the Portland backcourt. And it, it's anticlimactic. Uh, last week, you know, they kind of raised uh, raised some red flags with what they gave up Robert Covington and Norman Powell for, and this kind of just was was a white flag on the season. I was talking to a friend of mine, and we were saying, you know, this is either they know they're going to make another move or two right now, or they know they're going to announce that Damian Lillard's out for the year after this abdominal surgery. And they're just flushing the season, tank it, get a pick, do whatever you have to do, and just push it to next year. The one thing I will say that this trade does do for the Blazers is it gives them a $20 million trade exemption, and it'll probably clear up to $60 million in cap space for the summer. So if they want to try to lure some big free agents or take on some contracts, they're going to be in a better position to do so. And they're not just paying, you know, into the luxury tax to try to fight to make it into the play-in for an extra couple games. Um, it's just a shame because CJ and Dame were one of the best backcourts in the league uh, for a very long time. And it's a, it's a shame that they don't have more to show for that run because I think their, their dynamic together as a backcourt is a lot better than the results will have you thinking now, looking at it now that it's over. Um, on the Pelican side, this is a really good, really good move. Um, they're fighting for a play-in spot now. They started like 1-12 and 12 and have completely turned it around to, uh, I want to say 22 and 30, something like that. They're kind of clawing their way back into that, that play-in situation. Uh, Brandon Ingram is playing like an absolute all-star for another season. They still don't have Zion. Um, giving up Josh Hart is going to hurt the team a little bit on that wing defense, but Herb Jones, their rookie pick, has been been a pretty dynamic player for him. He's been a huge surprise. So I think they probably felt comfortable giving up Hart, knowing they had this rookie. And now you grab CJ, you get a, a legitimate two to pair with Ingram. That's a that's a legitimate one-two punch. Then you hope Zion comes back at some point. Whether they made this move expecting him back or thinking he'll be done for the year it still bolsters that offense enough and gives them that veteran guard presence that when, when things start to break down, there's another person on the court that can make a play for himself and that can get his own shot. And I'll be interested to see if they give CJ more of a ball handling role. Um, just because Dame was such a ball dominant, dominant point guard next to him. So I'll be interested to see if they, if they tap into that and use him to facilitate a bit more because Ingram is pretty good with the ball in his hands. But I think it could be it could be a huge boost for that Pelicans team. They lose some depth, but like I said, Herb Jones and and some of the other pieces that they have are probably more than enough to supplement that. And then just with with Ingram playing as good as he is, you don't waste that season. And maybe it entices Zion to come back sooner, keeps him happy, keeps the the talk of him being traded from from you know heating up a bit. And they just move on and start trying to become that that playoff team, not just a play-in team. Uh, so I thought that was it. I was I was like, wow, I can't believe this right before the deadline. Like I would have thought we would have had a like a better offer for CJ there than that because CJ was like the linchpin of a couple Ben Simmons rumors, 
And like to go from like a Ben Simmons rumor to Josh Hart, Nikhil Alexander Walker, Didi Lozada, and Tomas Sadoransky is is a steep drop in perceived value. Uh, so I'll be really curious to like see if the truth ever comes out on that. But that wasn't all. The Sacramento Kings were in a great spot. They had a ton of young talent at the guard position. They had a lot of teams apparently interested in De'Aaron Fox, who just signed his max extension. Uh, They were looking, you know, they could potentially clear that, trade him, move off of that deal, build around Tyrese Halliburton, Davion Mitchell. (sighs) And instead, they trade for DeMontis Sabonis, giving up uh, Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald. Buddy Heald finally traded. Uh, it's been rumored. It's been we've been waiting with bated breath. Kings fans have been waiting with bated breath. I'm sure. Uh, Marvin Bagley punching the air right now that he is still in that Kings uniform. Uh, but the full trade is Demontis Sabonis, Jeremy Lamb, and Justin Holiday and a second round pick in 2027 to Sacramento for Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, and Tristan Thompson. So, needless to say, Kings fans. I understand. I understand the pain. I understand. It was it was a it was an emotional day in uh, Kings Reddit, Kings Twitter, uh, just for for Kings fans all across the world. It was an emotional day because um, this was a huge blunder. <laughs> there's no there's no other way to put it. The Kings really shot themselves in the foot here with this because uh, not even bringing back a first round pick for. Tyrese Halliburton, who was arguably the best and most valuable player on that team, not just by by on court stance, but also his his rookie contract still being under that rookie contract for like two more years, is a is a huge bargaining piece. And to to bring back Sabonis is is you know it's a it's a good get because he's an all star caliber player, but that doesn't do any like that doesn't push the Kings to they're not going to challenge the Suns now. They're not going to be that that dominant Western Conference team now. Like, if anything, they might be, like, the seventh seed instead of the ninth seed, and they'll have the home play-in game. Like, to me, this is, like, a sideways move. Like, I saw a lot of people comparing it to, like, 2K, where it's, like, this is just a trade for the sake of making a trade because you wanted to shake it up. <laughs> and with, with rumors that the Knicks and a couple other teams were interested in De'Aaron Fox... It's crazy to me that they would still opt for this package for Tyrese Halliburton. Uh, Not to mention Buddy Hield, who they probably could have talked to a team like the Lakers or one of those other contender teams into overpaying for. Um, It just feels like such an odd, odd deal. And I think that in a nutshell is like the Kings experience. Like Davion Mitchell has been a great guard. He's been a, well, he's been a good guard for this rookie year. And he's she's shown that his defense absolutely translated over uh, without any question, but he can't shoot. And Darren Fox has nights where he's is super inefficient. He's turning the ball over. He's he's not creating like a playmaker should. And Tyrese Halliburton was always the the steadying part of that. And so obviously he's going to be the the player everyone wants. But he he should have been the untouchable. Like you would think he would be completely untouchable. He'd be the cornerstone of the rebuild. It'd be a trade around Bagley, Heald, maybe Fox, and then call it call it in, call it a day. Uh, so I'll be really curious to see what the Kings look like with Sabonis on the court uh, with these guys. But I just, I feel so bad for Kings fans, which is an odd spot for me to be in because I'm a Lakers fan and I hate the Kings. Like I grew up hating every single person that was even like affiliated with the Kings. So to see them, like to see the fans who are good basketball fans be, you know, this miserable and be this upset, it's like, I, I don't understand it because fortunately, like the Lakers haven't ever done that, but it's just, it's, it's crazy. And I don't understand the thinking for Indiana. It's a no brainer for the Pacers. I, I can't believe there's going to be a backcourt of. Malcolm Brogdon and Tyrese Halliburton that we get to watch now. I don't know what that means for Miles Turner. They might keep him and let him play with someone like Halliburton, or they might see what they can get for him and go full tank, full rebuild, full youth movement. 
Um, I'm really not sure, but either way, it, it kind of seems like the pieces fit a bit better. You can put Miles Turner as like the true setter, run an offense through him, let him make those decisions out of the post. He's shown it at times he can be adept to to playmaking, to passing, to, to moving without the ball, to making the right decision. And I think it just, it unlocks a lot of his skill set a bit more. He seems like one of those centers that wasn't made to be in like a two towers type of offense. So I'll be really curious to see. It's a shame that he's hurt right now because with the trade deadline Thursday, they're going to have to decide if they want to just move him and call it a day or if they want to wait and see what it looks like and risk it. But you know, it's tough to not get to see at least a little bit on the court, but this close to the deadline, you know, it probably wouldn't have happened anyways. And that's it on trades. Uh, there's still all the rumors about James Harden and the Sixers and the Nets and that whole mess. The Nets have lost 15 games since New Year's Day or something, some crazy amount of games, and they seem to just be having a major identity crisis. Um, so who knows if they're going to panic trade or what could happen there. And then the last the last big woes bomb we got wasn't even a trade. It was that the Bradley Beal, who was another popular name in this, this trade buzz because of his ties, not ties, but because of basically Daryl Morey wanting him for Ben Simmons and just forcing his name into that conversation. Um, he's going to have season-ending wrist surgery. And this is big for a couple of reasons. One, the Wizards started hot and have really cratered to earth and have been fighting to to keep a playing spot since then, uh, since their hot start. And losing him is obviously a huge blow to that. Uh, two, he was a popular trade piece. He was a popular trade name floating around. It seemed like uh, Wizards fans were a little bit more on board with the idea of trading him now. Um, he hasn't had as good a season as he had over the last couple of years, so I think you know, fans were kind of eager to just kind of pull the band-aid off and get started with younger players or something. I, I mean, I don't know a ton of Wizards fans. That's the impression I got, but I could be way wrong. And then third, he's eligible for a gigantic max contract extension next season. So the Wizards are going to really be in a tough spot here where it's like, do we pay him? over 200 million dollars do we trade him and do we do we just risk letting him go like not being able to have him on the court now for the rest of the season with this team to see how the pieces fit is is a tough spot to be in when you're looking at a potential 200 million dollar plus investment so it puts the wizards in an even more unfortunate spot um they go from a team that was rumored to be interested in a couple trades to probably just staying put uh, maybe they trade someone like a Spencer Dinwiddie um, Montres Harrell someone like that someone like on the on the fringes but I don't think it's going to be like a huge splashy move now anymore like a Beal trade um, and and you know that's probably for the best because Bradley Beal could bounce back and be a great player immediately he's shown multiple times that he's that he wants to stay in Washington kind of I guess he kind of seems to go back and forth with it um, which, you know, if the team wants to just be tired of that, that's fine too. Um, and that's, and that's it. I'm, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen when I wake up tomorrow now. Cause it seems like as we get closer to the deadline, it's just rumors going crazy. So we'll see what more craziness happens. And then Thursday, no matter what, I'll be back because we'll have the trade deadline. We'll see what moves actually get called in. Uh, but of course, if there's anything big, uh, tomorrow I'll hop back on. Um, in the comments, let me know what you think about these trades, who you think won, who you think lost, um, what you think the Kings are thinking. Uh, if you're a Kings fan, I'm very sorry. Uh, let it out in the comments. It's okay. This is a safe place. Uh, <laughs> thank you for watching, and I will be back soon.